In this lecture, uh, I plan to cover some of the approaches that we have seen in previous lectures uh, towards building uh, useful microsystems. If you may recall, uh, microsystems fabrication involve a series of process steps. Many of them are done within this uh, loop where you have deposition, uh, patterning, uh, pattern transfer and then you know repeat those uh, to build useful microsystems. Deposition schemes involve uh, evaporation, sputtering. Uh, these are two of the physical deposition schemes commonly used. There are several uh, chemical vapor deposition schemes. On top of these films, we transfer the resist and then uh, pattern transfer the pattern using lithography and then use various types of etching to remove part of the film. And then you can add another film and then continue this process and the like. We can we have seen how this could be extended towards uh, building freestanding cantilever structures like the one that you see here. What we do there is to start with the silicon wafer and then add a silicon dioxide layer which works essentially as a sacrificial layer uh, later and on top of this uh, silicon dioxide layer we add a polysilicon layer which uh, would remain here as the structural member. These materials are tentative, you could use possibly other various other materials with some constraints in terms of their chemical and other properties. We will see now how this could be extended to building useful devices for example, a micro relay or an RF switch. The configuration of this could be one of these, it could be either based on a cantilever beam and or a double supported beam. In this first case, when the beam is actuated electrostatically, the contact is made and there will be a transmission from one end to the one side to the other. In this case, in this example that you see here, when the actuation takes place, there is a short circuiting happens which essentially bypasses the circuit. So, in both cases as you see, what we essentially have is a equivalent arrangement that you see here, where you know the, 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 the beam structure is supported and is actuated an electrostatic force basically pulls it down. Now, to realize these devices, we essentially need to create this gap while fabrication and that is where surface micro machining can help. So, in one of the devices that we have designed for this purpose, you know there is a slight difference in the beam structure that you see here and you may notice that there is a small electrode be behind those things. So, the first layer of this whole geometry would look somewhat like this, where this is essentially the input side, this is the output side and these two bigger patches that you see are essentially the ground uh, traces. The square patch that you see here is essentially the uh, bottom electrode that will be used and that is that you may see behind the mesh like thing that on this side. Uh, obviously, we will need to have these traces also. So, the next step would be to add uh, after patterning this. So, if you actually see the various masks that would be used to build such a device, the first mask should essentially define something like this. In the next mask, we need to define essentially a dielectric layer which would be protecting the bottom electrode, uh, protecting uh, because you know it, it has to prevent the arcing happening when this uh, top electrode comes down and touches that. So, it essentially protects that. So, that has to be patterned obviously after deposition. The next would be to 
deposit and pattern the sacrificial layer. So, that essentially creates the elevation required to put the cantilever beam in this case. So, after this the cantilever beam is uh, defined and patterned and in this case as you see it consists of a series of fingers is essentially to help in uh, you know increasing the speed of etching while uh, you know the sacrificial layer is later removed. It also helps in the dynamic characteristics of this device. It reduce you know it sort of reduces the voltage required to activate this device and things like that. But this is one you know improvisation that we have done to fabricate uh, a, a micro relay kind of a uh, device. So, uh, as you could see there are all these uh, at least these four mass are required to fabricate a device as uh, which may appear as simple as this. And if you go through the process steps we can start with the substrate and on top of this first as you have seen the transmission line is fabricated by first. Uh, evaporating aluminum onto it and then patterning this aluminum. The next step is to uh, use SiO2 to uh, basically uh, add this protection layer that I mentioned and on top of that after patterning this we will add the sacrificial layer to create this height. And in this particular case we create some room here so that a uh, anchor can be built to construct the cantilever later. So, the anchor is first uh, built and then the uh, cantilever structure is built and this is patterned and then uh, the uh, sacrificial layer is removed by plasma etching. So, as you could see a number of process steps are required and all of these have been discussed in detail in uh, the lecture on sacrificial uh, in the, uh, the, the surface micro machining process that we have seen. Bulk micro machining also discussed can be used for various uh, devices as you see here one can build cavities, one can build tip like st structures, one can build cantilevers or grooves using bulk micro machining process. All those processes have been discussed separately. Now, look at a um, uh, full fledged pressure sensor using this approach. You see that there is a diaphragm kind of a geometry here and then there is this uh, cavity below that. How do we go about building this? Now, as you see we need to build all these thin films, you also need to create this cavity. You have seen that cavity like this could be built by bulk micro machining. You have seen that all these things could be all these layers could be added by this series of deposition and patterning steps and one can build all these layouts on the top. How about going uh, fabricating a device like this? The first thing that you should remember is that if you first do this etching you can obviously not put all these additional layers horizontally like this because if you do this first when you deposit these layers they will go and sit conformally onto this cavity here. So, how can we actually fabricate a geometry like this? You will have to think of alternate ways of doing we will basically first build all those top layers and pattern them and then only etch through sideways and etch down towards the substrate. So, in this particular case we have nitrite deposited and patterned and polysilicon layers added which would essentially work as those resistors which would whose uh, resistance would change based on the deformation and additional layers and finally, this uh, KOH etching the anisotropic etching of silicon. If you recall anisotropic etching of silicon is 
uh, can result in significant undercuts. Undercut meaning uh, etching below some kind, uh, some top geometry. So, if the window is defined properly, it, the etch window from the top of the wafer is defined properly, it is possible to go underneath and etch uh, create a cavity below that. So, a, a thing to remember is that although this geometry like you know it looks appealing that we are going from bottom to top, it should you should not be etching the pyramidal uh, pit first. And uh, you should also think about the chemical compatibility in deciding the process flow because if you are using this KOH etching, the layers that you have put previously here should not be affected by this KOH etching. So, we may have to choose materials and processes for this previous layers uh, based on what is going to come. So, this is one approach of building something on top of a cavity like this. There are there is an alternate approach to build uh, structures above cavity and many of those use what is called the wafer bend bonding process. What can be done is that you create this cavity and then bond another wafer on top of it to create this kind of a kind of closed cavity. It can be extended for cantilever kind of structures as well and this process as I mentioned is called wafer bonding process. As you see from the flow chart that we have been using, the wafer bonding process is one of those steps which is used in in this closed loop which what I mean to say is that even after it is done first of all while the full wafer is under process. Secondly, it is uh, it can be subjected to subsequent processing of deposition and etching afterwards. The question is how do we do this and uh, you may recall this is now a partially made geometry. So, how do we add a wafer on to the surface of a partially made uh, structure? To do that, this, there are various approaches of attaching to wafers, maybe silicon to silicon, maybe silicon to glass, uh, various op options are available to do that. And Basically, what we do is that we start with these two wafers. In the silicon to silicon case, we have a outside layer in between, which essentially facilitates this, uh, you know, the close bonding between them. And this bonded wafer is so well knit that it works as good as a, you know, a regular single wafer that you would otherwise see. So. Uh, we will see the process steps involved in creating this kind of uh, bonded together wafers and how to build uh, devices out of that. So, as, I, as you would notice this kind of bonding is a very crucial thing in many micro systems. There are several approaches to uh, build the bonded wafers of two substrates of silicon or a silicon and a wafer, uh, glass wafer or it could be based on additional layers as you would see to later in this lecture. One thing that you should note is that this is bonding between two uh, usually two complete wafers. It is not a part of a device getting added to a part of another device. So, you know it is not like the, the conveyor belt approach of fabrication, it is a batch approach of fabrication as you have seen. One of the approaches as I mentioned for bonding to silicon wafers is by uh, anodic bonding. So, as the name suggests, there are electrodes 
and uh, you know you apply a potential between them and to bring them in contact you also need to provide a sufficient uh, contact force and pressure and also to enable the bonding we will also use a temperature of the order of 400 degrees centigrade. So, what happens is that you know you, you may know that if you put two glass pieces together they have they developed sufficient bonds that you know unless you apply some kind of a shear force they do not separate out. So, when you have this kind of mirror finish to the wafers that you have there is a chance that they are already in, 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 in good contact. We need to ensure that this contact remains and does not even go away even when you apply a shear force and that is why these additional process steps are used to create this bonded wafer. This is a relatively low temperature uh, process which could therefore be used even when you know metal layers and others are included within the on the surface of silicon or glass. So, the process conditions would be in you know applying this potential applying a contact pressure and also applying a, a temperature. We wonder what would happen if we were to use these two different materials silicon and glass. It so turns out that some of the glass compositions that we use for this kind of purpose have the same uh, thermal expansion characteristics as the silicon wafer. So, there is no uh, shear force that would happen at the kind of temperature ranges that we are subjecting it to. So, it is not a problem from that point of view. So, when these uh, the, uh, the kind of glass that you see there and the silicon the wafer that you have if when these are bonded together essentially there is some kind of a migration of ions happening at the potential that you apply which would essentially you know facilitate the bonding to happen. So, the bond mecha formation mechanism is explained here. So, silicon under the uh, presence of uh, water would uh, create this SiO2 and they you know it is also uh, you know result in this SI or SI kind of a structure on the surface of the wafer. When there is you know sodium present in the kind of glass that we see there, this would result in an OH bond being created. So, the key process involved in this uh, wafer bonding of glass and silicon is essentially this thermal and electric field assisted activation of these ions and their drift which essentially result in the bonding together of these wafers. By the way these wafers need not be completely clean you could have partially built geometries as I mentioned on top of them, but essentially we need to ensure that there is sufficient blank area on top of the wafer which could be put to contact to create this kind of bonding mechanism. What I mean to say is that if you have a totally covered geometry on silicon then it may not work as well. Alternately it is also possible to bond to silicon uh, wafers by a process called fusion bonding or it is essentially a silicon to silicon direct bonding approach. This can be used to create what is known what are known as SOI silicon on insulator wafers. It is also used as I said in microsystems and many uh, microelectronic devices. So, in this case uh, also essentially the surface cleanliness, the flatness of surface and again uh, retaining the hydration of the surface at this high temperatures that it, this will be subjected to that would matter in the process. 
So, the surface roughness is a key thing in the success of uh, controlling the surface roughness is a key thing in the success of these approaches. These uh, uh, wafers can be used and have been used in IC processing itself and many of the CMOS processes could be subjected to because you have both on both sides silicon wafers. So, as I mentioned preparing the surface and you know retaining the roughness and bow within control bow of the wafer within control is the key thing in the success of uh, bonded wafers by this approach. After that just like you put two glass pieces together here you know we need to make them in contact and apply the uh, temperature and then uh, you know and then make them to you know bond together and usually we anneal it a higher temperature so that you know there is some kind uh, a permanent contact is made. Another approach that is often used is known as eutectic bonding. In this case, a thin layer of gold is used on top of the silicon to essentially enable this bonding. The temperature is of the order of 360 degrees with the kind of uh, right, uh, the uh, you know, basically the the well material has a you know a composition as you see there and uh, the next approach is by adding an extra adhesive layers, uh, layer uh, of various types like uh, uh, epoxies or polyamides which could uh, you know create the bonding between this at relatively lower uh, temperatures. So, that uh, you know uh, wafers uh, when the serious temperature rises that are required in the previous cases can be avoided. So, all these approaches uh, could be used for bonding to, uh, to wafers. Polymers as I mentioned have this uh, advantage that you know they have uh, their requirement is relatively lower temperatures. It is also possible to use some kind of a glass free layer uh, to facilitate this uh, bonding which could happen at a relatively uh, low temperatures and uh, low uh, stress. Now, we will see how this can be uh, extended to building micro systems. What I show here is an alternate approach to build a, a micro switch uh, using a process known as dissolved wafer process which involves uh, the glass to silicon bond. Essentially happens in three steps uh, how we attach this top uh, moving member onto this glass. We obviously start with a glass wafer and then pattern this conductor, the green or the red color conductor, which could be glow, uh, gold and can be patterned by either lithography or lift off. Lithography, if you recall, is a process in which first the gold, uh, the conductor layer is uh, deposited and then you spin the hot air assist and transfer the pattern and etch the conductor layer. Lift off on the other hand, we start with the resist and then pattern the resist and on top of the resist you put the conductor and subsequently remove the resist and along with the resist the unwanted region of the conductor is lifted off. Both these approaches could be used to create the conductor layer on the glass wafer that is. But this all novelty or uh, you know interesting characteristics come on fitting this additional uh, the, the beam on top of this glass wafer that you see here. To do that 
we actually start with a silicon wafer and we will do KOH etching which is essentially anisotropic etching to create this height on this silicon wafer. So, eventually the silicon wafer is going to sit on top of this glass wafer and we will bond them together. So, the depth of etching will decide how deep, how high this beam would eventually be. So, to create that thing we obviously need to first grow outside and then etch the outside to create the window and then etch the silicon to create this gap and then remove this outside and you have this pat uh, patterned silicon wafer. On to this wafer, we now uh, do a boron deposition, a serious deposition of uh, a boron and uh, so that it becomes a heavily doped thin layer. So, again we do a uh, outside deposition and uh, again pattern the outside so that this uh, region is exposed and then diffuse by putting this in a diffusion furnace and uh, add uh, then after the diffusion the outside is stripped and you have this uh, layer which will be heavily doped region of uh, silicon. The next is essentially the anodic bonding which could be used to bond silicon and glass wafers. So, these are added together, bonded together and then we essentially dissolve this gray shaded region of silicon and after that what would remain is this uh, structure that you see there. So, in this case the ultimately, the ultimately what we have on the working device would be a glass wafer on which there is this conductor layer which works as the transmission lines and we have this heavily doped region of silicon which would work as the top electrode which could move up and down. So, by uh, combining anodic bonding and wafer dissolution we can construct geometries, freestanding geometries like this almost the same way as surface micro machining, but without getting into issues caused by the removal of sacrificial layer such as stitching and associated problems. So, this is one of the early successful approaches for building freestanding structures. There are also uh, several commercial approaches which could be used for building uh, a fairly complicated uh, micro systems. What I show here is the uh, picture of a varactor used uh, fabricated using a commercial process. So, you see here a large plate which is essentially a moving structure and associated with this there is a smaller plate which would be actually the uh, actuating electrodes in this particular case and uh, you know. So, a fairly complicated looking geometries could be done by this approach. It could also be the same approach as you will see from the websites that the same approach could be used for building even more complicated structures such as a micro motor. We will see how a, a structure which has you know a stator and a rotor can be built by the planar processes that we have seen so far. Uh, and create how to create such a micro motor using these approaches. This uh, approach essentially has three layers of polysilicon 
uh, for b uh, and by surface micro machining such complicated geometry looking geometries could be fabricated. The detailed process flow available from the website is being discussed here. We start with a regular silicon wafer and build all these geometries and release them to create this freestanding uh, stator and rotor geometries on top of the silicon wafer. So, a regular silicon substrate is used for this purpose and on top of it a PSG phosphosilicate glass is uh, first deposited which works as a dopant source. So, it is uh, you know it has to be first uh, patterned using and then there is a polysilicon layer on top of this which would be patterned by the first mask layer that you have. On top of this we again uh, uh, you know after it is etched using plasma etch. Uh, LPCVD is used to uh, add another layer of uh, phosphosilicate glass. This uh, is essentially uh, the known as this first outside layer which would create the room when it is removed for the free movement of geometries. And then uh, on that essentially these anchors are built to build those uh, stator geometries, sorry the uh, rotor geometries. After the anchor is uh, built on the first structural layer, the a thin again another thin PSG layer is added and it is processed so that you know the stresses are removed and it, it remains continuous. So, what we essentially have is that we first deposit a poly 0 which is patterned and then a outside which is again uh, patterned then again poly. So, essentially it is a series of outside and poly deposition and patterning and you know if you go continuously like that we have we can we can create a, a you know this rotor and stator structures on top of this silicon. So, uh, by you know obviously one may need to take protective steps in the process so that you know uh, unwanted layers are not removed. So, we essentially have uh, these three layers of poly, poly 0, poly 1 and poly 2 which would be used for constructing these geometries vertically. And with the poly 2 layer we can create all these stator and rotor uh, geometries that you see there. On top of it you can add a metal layer to create the electrical contact slit. With this you know it is after removal of those uh, outside layers we can create these geometries to be free standing and uh, the wafers uh, could be you know uh, used as individual devices by, <coughs> by uh, you know dicing them. Usually if, I, if you recall dicing is done before the uh, 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 bef uh, uh, dicing is done sorry after uh, the uh, sorry before the uh, sacrificial layer is removed. So, sacrificial layer is removed uh, if you may recall by usually by this critical point drying process if it is used the scission can be avoided. So, you have seen that it is possible to build complicated fairly complicated looking geometries by these three layers of polysilicon which remain as structural layers. Are there any constraints? What can happen if you go on adding such layers 
to even more uh, more uh, things. Is it possible to build geometries that can actually you know stand vertically? What you see here is you know a schematic of uh, a, a hinge that has been fabricated uh, by microfabrication and made to stand vertically. It is possible to do that by having this you know it is only very few as you could see with the colors there are only very few layers that are used here. It is possible to make them to stand vertically by you know with slight modifications to the processes and we can even use them in an optical chip. But there are problems when you know if you just use those processes to build you know too many layers and then if you want to build something as complicated as the gear chain that has been developed by Sandia National Lab some time back. What happens is that when you add these subsequent layers, they sit conformally onto the surface of the existing layer. So, you know, each subsequent layer that we are adding after removing a thick layer will sit conformally and have this uh, ups and downs on them, and essentially the subsequent layers will not be flat. So, when you need geometries like this which should remain flat, there will be problems. To avoid these problems, a process known as CMP, chemical wave, uh, mechanical polishing is developed. This is essentially used for planarizing the wafers which is partially processed. So, as you see here it has both chemical and mechanical aspects of polishing. How do we polish it chemically? By essentially etching it and we have seen that the isotropic etching of silicon can be used to even out the surfaces. Obviously, you all know that mechanical grinding also do something similar. But in this case, you know, suitable materials are selected in such a way that we get something better than what could be achieved by individually by either of these. We can get a, a good optical properties for the surfaces and can create multi level, more than three levels of polysilicon by doing this by going with this approach. So, it has both the elements, it involves rotating the wafer under pressure this is for the polishing in a slurry which will also affect the chemical etching of the surface. So, the process involved would in, uh, be you know to put the wafer on a platen which would be rotating and in a slurry which would be a chemically active slurry and which also cause the mechanical action, mechanical grinding action to happen. So, in CMP both those actions will happen together and can be therefore used for quick polishing of the surface of the silicon wafer and this is widely used these days for both microelectronic uh, wafers and silicon. The use of CMP is very clear from the uh, pictures that you see here from the as you could see when you have uh, electrodes built on silicon and then we add the outside layer above it, the outside layer will have these bumps. It could be removed or you can even remove a you know layer almost entirely by you know by uh, having limit uh, switch based uh, uh, chemical uh, mechanical polishing of the silicon. It is also possible to do a similar thing even with uh, metallic layers on the top not just the outside that you saw there. So, the bottom line is that 
we can create planar geometries even after multiple deposition patterning steps uh, optically flat surfaces can be created by the CMP. The use of CMP is clear from uh, the slides that you uh, see here. If you see there are these uh, curved uh, surfaces and which could be removed by CMP. See this curved members which could be avoided if we were to use CMP in the middle. So, there is also another advantage in, uh, in using CMP especially for surface micro machining. It is the removal of what is known as stringers. When there is this continuous processes you know the because this uh, deposition is conformal the layer would go down and add to the sides and essentially may remain even after etching and a thin uh, you know a string kind of thing could remain and that is known as the string. This uh, in polysilicon uh, deposition and patterning is a major issue especially when we do this poly above uh, previously formed structural layers. It could be avoided and as we have mentioned the uh, a flat links could be formed and it is also uh, you know enables multiple layers of polysilicon structures uh, to be formed to build uh, complicated looking microstructures as the one that you see here from the Sandia labs. So, what we see so far is a you know uh, various possibilities with which uh, with adding a few layers of polysilicon or other materials one can build fairly complicated microstructures. As we have seen today wafer bonding is a key process that can enable various new possibilities into building microsystems on silicon. And it essentially adds more than one wafer either to uh, silicon wafers or a silicon wafer and a glass wafer. There are several high aspect ratio methods for uh, extending the processes that we have seen so far into building geometries which have sufficiently high aspect ratio. What we mean is that uh, usually it means that high vertical dimensions uh, for the structures or geometries. One of the uh, common process or one of the early processes suggested in this direction is known as LIGA. There are alternate approaches based on uh, totally different kinds of materials such as uh, polymers for the uh, which could essentially be used for low cost fabrication of such uh, high aspect ratio geometries. Uh, there you will also see that uh, the approaches such as uh, low temperature coffered ceramics could also be used to build high aspect ratio geometries. So, we will see now how the LIGA uh, which is a approach which is now available for about 30 years could be used to build uh, geometries based on the fabrication approaches that we have seen previously. It involves lithography to build thick layers, but different from what we have seen before it then you know uh, uses electroplating 
and kind of molding of parts to build these extended geometries. How does LIGA work? We use as I said X-ray lithography, Y X-rays compared to the optical lithography this can go deeper into the resist. So, we can use a thick resist layer which could be patterned by this X-ray lithography. Obviously, the mask that you would use should also be different to enable the X-rays uh, being used for this purpose. So, the desired uh, patterns are formed first on this resist. This resist in fact sits on a metallized let us say wafer. So, after it is patterned we essentially have this cavity formed. We then uh, form the uh, we use electroplating to build the uh, metal parts within this cavity that is there. Then use this metal we can use it as actually the metal products or we can use these metal molds essentially combined with plastics to you know uh, you know bulk produce parts like this. It may it is worthwhile to introspect on this approach compared to the silicon approaches that we have seen previously. There are several key differences. One, it uses X rays for the lithography. Second, it creates parts in numbers by a kind of molding or uh, uh, electroplate. Both these are different, but still the initial parts, the molds themselves were created by processes which are very similar to what is used in the silicon fabrication. Once again the mask that you use could should be different because you know it has to withstand the X-rays. Obviously, the X-ray based lithography is far more expensive than the optical lithography which is in, an in turn compensated during the bulk production steps because it is not involved there essentially this creates somewhat like the mask that you is eventually use in a typical photolithography process. We create the molds by the X-ray lithography. So, it is used less frequently as compared to the volume production approach, but still this could be used in bulk batch production and hence the approach is somewhat similar to the previous approach that we have seen before. So, uh, with this because we use X-ray X-ray for the lithography we can have parts which have high vertical dimension. So, by essentially by changing this one step from optical lithography to X-ray lithography or even though it is a, an expensive proposition one can build uh, geometries which are relatively thick. So, the advantages of LIGA process would be that one can build you know even up to hundreds of microns thick microstructures which could be patterned and this can even be combined with the surface micro machining and other conventional MEMS based approaches for building really useful micro systems. The point to note is that the X-ray lithography process which is the first step is fairly uh, expensive, but this is compensated by the uh, mass production 
of the large quantity of those secondary parts that were formed. So, uh, you know this is one of the early approaches for building uh, thick structures. The next approach uh, uh, again fairly established for building uh, high aspect ratio microstructures is known by the acronym HETSIL, which has this hexagonal honeycomb like geometries on silicon or polysilicon, which uh, could be you know uh, the process steps are somewhat similar to micro machining and it is compatible with CMOS based uh, electronic processes. So, this is a truly batch processing based approach, but it makes uh, you know uh, truly vertical geometries as you see a motor kind of geometry here, uh, uh, which has been fabricated by this approach. It essentially combines again a nickel uh, plating for creating this uh, conducting structures. It can be used to build uh, geometries such as micro uh, tweezers. Fairly long and thick, uh, vertically thick kind of geometries could be built by this approach. Obviously, from the mesoscale or large scale geometries that you see when you need such uh, long beams, you need to sub, uh, provide sufficient mechanical support and which is essentially provided by those honeycomb uh, structures. So, uh, uh, these uh, could be fabricated by the See, uh, geometries such as this could be fabricated by the process steps that are developed well over a decade ago. So, uh, you know, when uh, geometries such as this are built, it could be, you know, even used as a thermal actuator so that it could move. And when we build such thick geometries, as I mentioned, you can have fairly long uh, geometry. What you see here is the bottom view of this honeycomb structure, which essentially retains the polysilicon uh, structure, a uh, long polysilicon structure uh, intact. So, uh, this Hetzel approach uh, developed is uh, also a, 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 a very effective uh, way of making thick geometries on silicon. Uh, you will see that it is possible to build uh, similar or uh, even more uh, uh, even thicker geometries by using non silicon materials. We will discuss that in another lecture separately and I thank you for listening to this.